Very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to James Cook University's Singapore's professional professorial lecturer webinar series number four, the research and development pathways to grow aquaculture in the tropics. Today we have Professor Dean Jerry, who will be presenting the, the webinar. Um, I have a few housekeeping issues that I would like to share with the participants. Please note that the webinar will be recorded for publicity purposes. Attendees will be able to ask questions at any point of the webinar through the Q&A function. You should be able to see the Q&A function towards the, the bottom of your screen. The Q&A will be at the end of the presentation once Professor Jerry has finished his talk. There will be a satisfaction poll and a survey at the end of the webinar. And if you have any technical issues or difficulties, then please use the chat button to communicate with the event. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Abhishek, Abhishek Bhatti. I'm the campus dean at JCU Singapore. And this afternoon, we have Professor Dean Jerry, who is the Foundation Director of the Tropical Futures Institute at James Cook University, Singapore, who is also the Director of the ARC Research Hub for Advanced Prawn Breeding, a consortium of five institutions and more than 25 scientists, and a professor in aquaculture at JCU. He also was, until recently, the former Dean of Research at JCU, Singapore, Foundation Deputy Director of the Center for Sustainable Tropical Fisheries and Aquaculture and Academic Head of Aquaculture and Fisheries in JCU. Professor Jerry is extremely passionate about the potential for aquaculture to grow as a major food production industry and has been working with this emerging sector for over 20 years. First, as a research scientist at CSIRO, where he was involved in some of the first programs in aquaculture worldwide to attempt to selectively breed aquatic species such as kuruma prawns and freshwater crayfish. And later at James Cook University, where he now leads one of the largest research groups in Australia and Singapore, primarily devoted to the application of genetic technologies to improve aquaculture production and outcomes. Professor Jerry is considered as a global leader in the application of genetic breeding technologies to aquaculture species and has partnered with many companies in Australia, Oceania, in Southeast Asia, and elsewhere to improve the efficiency of production through targeted research and development. He has published more than 140 scientific papers, a book, and managed over 25 industry-linked research partnership valued more than $25 million. Dean tells me that his interest for aquaculture stems from when he was a young lad growing up on a mixed enterprise farm in outback New South Wales, a farm about the one eighth the size of island of Singapore. How lucky is that? On the farm, his father stocked the farm's lake with crayfish and native freshwater fish. Many visitors would come to the farm and see how prolifically the fish and the crayfish were growing and say that his family should farm the fish more intensively. Well, this piqued his interest in the future of fish farming and he went along to the university to obtain a degree in marine science. Since that point, in time, he has always seen the potential for aquaculture to become a global player in agribusiness, which is now finally being realized. Prof. Jerry's talk today will introduce aquaculture, its place in global food security, its evolution, and where R&D efforts are required in the future for the industry to continue to grow. The challenge of feeding the global population towards 2050 is immense, but there is one industry that has the ability to significantly stand out in its contribution to future of food production, that is aquaculture. And Prof. Jerry will tell you all about the industry and the research and development it needs to invest towards in his talk. So without any further ado, I invite Professor Jerry to deliver his talk. Over to you, Dean. Thank you, Abhishek. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the webinar. 
I must say I'm extremely excited to have an opportunity to talk to people from all around Australia and Southeast Asia and broader region about aquaculture. It's a real passion that I have and hopefully I can uh, articulate some of that passion to you through my talk today. I just want to start by presenting the food challenge and I'm sure that most of you are aware of this because it is very much in the news all the time and it's about food security moving into the future to about 2050. By 2050 there are predicted to be about 9 billion people on this planet and if we put this into context only 200 years ago there was 1 billion people. In 1950, there were only 3 billion people. The turn of this century, there were 6 billion people, and now 7.5 billion people. And the human population has grown at such a fast rate that it's said that now, between here and 2050, we have to produce nearly more food than has been consumed by the human population over the last 10,000 years. For us to do this, we actually have to increase our food production system dramatically by upwards of 70%. A massive challenge, given that many of our food sectors are already intensively operated. We also have this other issue in that the rising middle class is occurring across the globe, where people are becoming more affluent. And as they become more affluent, their diet changes. So their diet changes from effectively a cereal-based diet to one which incorporates larger amounts of animal-derived protein. So we have this double whammy of having to feed more people, intensify, and feed them in a different way potentially to what they're currently eating and towards more animal-based protein. Many of our traditional livestock based industries like beef and mutton, they're quite intensive. And for them to actually fill this need, they have to increase their production by about 30 to 35%, which is a massive challenge given use of land, environmental footprint and the like. So there's a massive challenge here. But the consumption of seafood derived protein is no different from other types of animal protein. So what we are seeing is that since 1950, when there was 3 billion people on this planet, the average consumption per capita of seafood has dramatically risen three times, where in 1950, on average, each person only ate about six kilograms of seafood. Whereas in 2015, nearly 20 kilograms of seafood is being eaten. So a massive change in our diet as a result of us moving towards this more seafood based diet. Much of this seafood, as you are aware, has come from our wild fisheries. And for us to supply this demand, we've had to do two things effectively. We've had to fish more intensively, go deeper into the ocean to catch the fish, and we've had to fish down the food chain to start to exploit new species that we haven't exploited before as a fishery. For instance, if you take a look here, over the last, since 1950, so the last 70 years, on average, we've had to fish 100 metres deeper in the ocean around the globe to obtain our seafood protein. You also are probably aware that many of our fisheries now are maximum exploitation. So if we have a look here at our fisheries, we find that we have a large number, about 25% are overfished, i.e. they're past their maximum sustainable levels. They're either fully fished and only about 10% of our fishery currently have some potential for us to fish heavier. So there's not much potential for us to actually obtain more seafood protein 
from the ocean. And in fact, people talk about peak oil, for instance. Well, we reach peak fish from wild fisheries back in about 1995. And since that point, despite all our increased efforts, really, we have not increased dramatically the amount of seafood coming from wild fisheries. What we have seen, however, is something quite significant and dramatic. We've seen the rise of this industry called aquaculture, which is only a young industry effectively as an industrial industry. Here on the graph, you can see I was born in 1971, and that's not that long ago. I know I still look 21, but I'm a little bit older than that. But at that time, only about 5% of the global seafood was from farm sources. If we explorate up to now, we're at a situation where we have 50% of the global seafood comes from farm sources. And it's this dramatic increase in production that really helped uh, us to supply that demand for seafood without causing total collapse of our marine and freshwater wild fisheries. So aquaculture, this big supplier of seafood protein, what is it, people might ask. Now I'm sure many of the audience are in aquaculture and they know aquaculture or they've heard me uh, rave on about aquaculture in the past. But aquaculture is effectively the farming of any aquatic organisms. And it can be very diverse. It can be like what we would expect, our fish species like salmon or uh, my favourite species of fish, that of barramundi. Or it can be other things like crustaceans, like shrimp and prawns. It can even be crocodiles, which are farmed for their meat and for their, for their leather. Frogs are farmed in an aquaculture scenario. Plants like seaweeds and microalgae. Even pearls for jewellery production is a form of aquaculture. So aquaculture can be very diverse in the species we are talking about but they all have one commonality in that they are farmed, owned by somebody, and that they rely somewhere in their production system on the use of water. Now, aquaculture actually does have a long history. We have some knowledge that aquaculture was first for, performed about 500 years BC. And there's actually a manual explaining how to do aquaculture written by a guy called Fan Le in China. And he describes how to put carp into a pond, how to look after them and then harvest them to sell them to make money. We know that the ancient Egyptians practiced a type of ranching because we see the evidence of this in hieroglyphics on pyramids. And here, what they did is they, during the flooding of the Nile, they uh, cut off canals which had tilapia in them. And they effectively trapped these fish in these canals, let them fatten up, and then they harvested them. The Romans actually practiced the first form of oyster aquaculture, 100 years AD. You can see in this diagram here from 97 AD, which outlines a uh, Roman bridge. And under this bridge, hanging here, are ropes containing oysters. And how do we know that these are oysters? Because Austria Tria is the Latin name for oysters, or the derivative of the Latin name. So it has an ancient history, but it's not really until the 1960s, just before I was born, that aquaculture really become industrialised. And we've seen this dramatic event happen where pretty much over the last 10,000 years, all our land and plant species that we rely on for food were domesticated. And since about 100 years ago, very few new animals and plants from the land have been industrialised and used as food. But for aquaculture, within the last 100 years, or even the last uh, 70 years, we have seen a situation where 
we have gone from only 73 species under culture to 613 around the globe. And that is still continuing, where in various countries, their local species are domesticated and farmed. But as an, as an industry, aquaculture is very young. Most of the world's aquaculture production comes from Asia, comes from China in actual fact, but China and Asia probably account for maybe 85 to 90 percent of the world's aquaculture production. So the region around Singapore, across that tropical belt, is one of the major producers of this seafood protein globally. Why do people like seafood? Well, it's important to realise that seafood, and particularly farm seafood in many cases, is just more than talking about animal protein. Seafood actually delivers a lot of essential micronutrients like zinc and iron, fatty acids like omega-3, which are good, of course, for our cardiovascular system. And in general, it's a very nutritious and healthy product for us to consume. If we actually look at the nutritional profiling of farm fish versus wild fish, it's actually counterintuitive to what some people think. Because actually for some components like omega-3, which are those essential fatty acids that we need, farm fish quite often have higher levels than that of their wild counterparts. As you can see here from farm barramundi versus wild barramundi in Australia. And this is derived mainly because of their diet, where they obtain more of these precursors in their diet to produce this essential and important omega-3 nutrient. Compared to terrestrial animals, we should all be eating more seafood. So our humble barramundi, for instance, has 20 times more omega-3s in it than your, your chicken. Four times more than beef and lamb and eight times more than cattle. It has half the fat of chicken and pork. It's got less sodium and actually is a very rich source of selenium, phosphorus and potassium. So very, very healthy for us to, to eat. And this is one of the attraction of why the diet is changing for people. Even our seaweeds, which are aquacultured, are more nutritious than many of our common cereal and uh, vegetable-based commodities. For instance, if we look at fibre, our seaweeds actually have a lot more fibre in them than brown rice and bananas. In calcium, we all drink lots of milk because calcium, milk gives us lots of calcium for our bones, right? Well, we should actually be having seaweed shakes instead of milkshakes because seaweeds actually have vast amounts more calcium in them than what is in actual milk. So, we're talking about very nutritious products here that are being farmed and produced. Aquaculture also has another virtue in that it is actually a very sustainable way for us to produce food compared to many of our other food sectors. So, for instance, if we are looking at the food conversion rate, the amount of food that an animal eats to the amount of protein that it turns into flesh, we see that it takes about eight kilograms of feed to produce one kilogram of steak. Whereas the salmon and our shrimp and prawns, for instance, they're very effective. It only takes 1.3 kilograms of food to turn one kilogram of protein. And this is because many of our aquaculture species are cold-blooded and they don't have to spend a lot of energy in maintaining their body heat. Also counterintuitively, aquaculture is more efficient at using water. How you say they grow in water. What's this guy talking about? Maybe he's had a few drinks before this seminar. He's a bit confused. Maybe I did, but I'm not confused. Basically, we see that if we want to farm barramundi, to produce one kilogram of barramundi, it only takes about 450 litres of water because we can culture them very intensively in this water. Whereas again, for your one kilogram of steak, that cow has to drink 
15,400 litres of water for every kilogram. So we definitely should not be eating beef over barramundi. In terms of nutrients as well, on a per kilogram per tonne of protein produced, you can also see that our aquaculture species are actually less polluting in terms of nitrogen emissions and phosphorus emissions, which are very serious pollutants for the environment. And in fact, some aquaculture species like that of oysters are extractive. They clean the water up and make it better than what the water going in is. So quite a sustainable industry. So this is the situation of where we are, essentially. So we've seen here that since 1990 to 2025, many of our other industries really haven't grown dramatically in terms of their output of um, production. Whereas the total seafood component has grown dramatically and within that, that aquaculture component has grown dramatically from its humble beginnings to now supply at least 50% of the world's seafood and into the future, we'll start to supply 60 and 70% as we move towards 2050. So hopefully I've convinced you a little bit about you know, aquaculture and its role in food security. But I want to impinge on you, and this is the point of my talk essentially, is that aquaculture as an industry, even though it has this meteoric rise, it still needs to be recognised as an embryonic industry. It is effectively only about 70 years of old age for most of the species farming. For some species, we're talking about five or 10 years. Also, aquaculture operates in essentially a black box. Once you put animals into the water, into a pond, often it's very hard to see what is happening within that pond and how to uh, properly uh, grow the animals or whether the animals are healthy or whether they're feeding well. They're very hard for us to get. So aquaculture still operates in what we call a black box. And it's this black box which really is where the future is for aquaculture R&D to operate in the future. We need to start to unpack that black box and understand every nuance of the way we farm these aquatic species. And that is what my talk essentially is leading into. I want to now um, highlight to people where I see the future R&D areas of focus for aquaculture to continue to grow. It has grown dramatically over the last 70 years, but it still has a major challenge. How do we fulfill our destiny by 2050 to provide upwards of 80 million tonnes of seafood product to the global population. The first way that we need to put effort, or the first area we need to put effort into, and it's one that's very close to my heart, and that is obviously why I said this first, is that of genetics. So genetics, is a very powerful way for us to improve productivity of the species that we farm, whether they're plant or they're animal. But you may be surprised to, to know that despite that meteorotic rise of aquaculture, our current production, only 10% is based on animals that have been selectively bred or improved. Only 10%. The power of genetics to increase productivity and particularly produce animal protein can be really seen from what we're seeing with the chicken. So the chicken actually was only really started to be domesticated and selectively bred about 1960. And since that time, there have been large genetic improvement programs and there have been large programs to improve the nutrition of these uh, birds. Well, some pretty funky experiments showed that if we took those chicken strains that were around in 1957 or 60, and our current chicken strains, and we took the new diets that had been developed uh, over that time, and we did a pretty funky experiment, what we found that 
the chicken strains have improved in growth by 400%, as you can really see here, from here to here, or from here to here, sorry. And only 14% of that is due to nutritional improvements and husbandry improvements. Sorry, Kathleen and Leo, our nutritionists. 380 odd percent of that improvement is due to genetic improvement. And as a result, chicken is everywhere. You can't get away from chicken. It's one of our biggest traded animal protein commodities globally. Now we can do the same thing with aquaculture species where we can improve productivity through genetic improvement very, very dramatically if we apply good uh, selective breeding principles. For instance, if we use Atlantic salmon as a case study, we see that in 1970, Atlantic salmon took about four years to grow to a market size of four to eight kilograms. And at that time, the Norwegian government, in their wisdom, uh, funded the start of a genetic improvement program. Whereas by around 2000, the year 2000, the growth rate of salmon had been halved. They grew twice as fast. And as a result, now salmon is a global commodity. We're back in the 1970s, 1980s, very expensive and, and hard to source uh, food commodities. And along with this genetic improvement, we've had this significant doubling in growth rate. The feed consumption has halved, so they're growing faster on less food. They're retaining more protein, more energy. And actually the benefit to industry that's come from a genetic improvement program was that for every dollar that was put into this program, it returned $15 of benefit to the industry. So genetics has the power to dramatically help us feed the world. If I just use my, my first ever foray into genetic improvement of an aquaculture species, it was the humble freshwater crayfish, Shirax constructor, which is an Australian indigenous freshwater crayfish. And we started a selective breeding program based on growth. And what you can see here is that in two generations of selective breeding, by breeding from these guys, which are the best of the best, the fastest growing, we were able to increase the growth rate from an average of 60 grams over the period that we grew them to be 83 grams. So 30% heavier in two generations of selective breeding, 30% increased product. And so we do have the power to dramatically improve animals through selective breeding. In fact, if we could increase through R&D investment, the enabling of more selective breeding programs, we could actually dramatically fill the future uh, gaps that are going to be for animal and seafood protein on this planet. At the moment, we are currently producing about 55 million tonnes of aquaculture product and only a bit under 10% of this product comes from selective breeding. Well, Gedrum and their colleagues, they modelled what happens if we had 25% of those species under selection. 50%, 75%, or 100%. And as you can see, just by applying genetics by itself, we can dramatically increase the tonnage of product that is coming out of our aquaculture system. They will grow faster, they will grow more sustainably, and they will help to feed the world. This approach that's been applied to date has been a traditional selective breeding approach. Just take the best of the best, breed them together, um, assume that the phenotype that you are selecting on, it might be growth, has some sort of genetic basis that you can pass from parents to progeny, and then you choose the best progeny and breed from them again. It has been very effective, but it's a bit of a black box approach in itself because this phenotype that we see has a genetic component, which is often quite small, and this huge environment component to its expression. And often it's very hard for us to separate those two components out when we just look at the phenotype. 
But where future R&D is heading and where our investment needs to go to into the future for our aquaculture species is to unleash the potential which is within the genome itself and start to interrogate the genomic information to help us make breeding decisions. And this process is what we call genomic selection. And it's something that we've been doing a lot of here at JCU with our partners uh, in various projects, in shrimp and barramundi and flounder, for instance. And it's effectively based around where we have a training population of animals with their phenotypes. We genotype them at thousands of markers within the genome. And then we come up with an algorithm, which effectively based on that genomic information, predicts the phenotype. And then all we have to do into the future is to genotype our selection animals, identify which ones based on the genomic information are the best and breed from them. And essentially a DNA test. Now it's a little bit more complex than that, but I'm not going to go into it too deeply in this seminar. But what it allows us to do is when my slide changes over, is it increases our accuracy of actually being able to select animals. So some good examples of this is we look in salmon, Atlantic salmon sea lice, where they're trying to breed for resistance to this parasite, which causes massive uh, production losses in the salmon industry. And by using just normal selective breeding approaches based just on the pedigree of animals, we find that we have this level of accuracy when we are choosing our species to breed from or our individuals to breed from. If we overlay the use of genomic information through genomic selection, we can get sometimes a 10 to 15% boost in accuracy, which means that because the accuracy of selection determines largely how much genetic gains we can make each generation, we can make larger and larger genetic gains than we are currently doing. We've been doing a bit of this work in various shrimp species, both betamine and in monodon, the black tiger shrimp. And again, what we've been able to see is that by using the genome to provide information once we've trained an algorithm, our accuracy of selection can be very high, 60 or 70 percent, which, which often is very much higher than just basing on a phenotype or a pedigree by itself. So this is an area of R&D investment that we need to put more effort into so we can etch out those maximum genetic gains. There are some challenges for us here, however, in that we have 600 and I forget that number, 613 species that we are currently farming and probably uh, 550 of them have very poor genomic resources. So we have very few off the shelf um, genomic resources for them. So we need to develop them. We also need to be able to industrially scale phenotype the animals because it's pretty hard actually to measure tens of thousands of shrimp and use that information in our breeding program to train these algorithms. And the other real challenge for us where R&D has to help in terms of development of these markers is bring down that cost of genotyping because at the moment it can be quite uh, expensive. So traditional selective breeding and genomic selection a one way by which we're going to increase the productivity of our aquaculture species through genetics. The other one is this, which is on the horizon, that of gene editing. And I'm sure you've all heard of GMOs and gene editing, everybody's going, oh, I don't like this. Where's he going with this? Well, actually, gene editing is on the horizon to be applied in most food production sectors because it has unequivocally been shown to be safe for humans. There is not a study anywhere on the globe which really is showing an adverse effect on human health from that of GMOs. And our genetic modification technologies now are very precise, particularly through the use of this new technology called CRISPR, Cas9, which allows us to edit with precision a gene and change its uh, activity. As an illustration of just the power of 
us being able to gene edit an animal, like a salmon. There's this famous uh, example called the GM salmon or uh, the um, salmon produced by a company called Aqua Bounty, who are now uh, Aqua Advantage. And what they have done is taking a gene from the Chinook salmon, which produces a protein, a growth protein, along with another gene from uh, another species which expresses all the time, put them in the Atlantic salmon, and this is what you get. These two fish are the same siblings. Can you guess which one has the GMO uh, gene in it? I bet you can't guess. Well, I'm gonna tell you. It's this one. Three times faster it will grow, simply, simply because it has an extra um, expressed gene for a growth promoter in its um, body. And so if we really do get stuck for food, this is a good potential way for us to increase our productivity. But the technology used to produce that uh, Atlantic salmon wasn't really precise. It's a bit like a sledgehammer. And we've evolved now to actually have much more precise technology. And R&D in the future, we'll need to be invested in how do we unharnish the genome in a way by which we can increase our productivity through using something like CRISPR-Cas9. This is very precise and allows us to make very small gene modifications, which actually quite often are natural mutants within the species. So we're not necessarily talking about a completely genetically modified organism. What we are talking about is trying to produce more of these natural mutants that might have these rare genes or alleles in the population that give us a good trait. But as another example of the power, there's this gene called myostatin, which we worked on quite a bit with Barramundi as well, but never, never knocked it out using gene technology yet. But this gene is an anti-muscle growth gene. And so when it's expressed in high proportion, it impedes the growth of muscle. But if you can depress it through using CRISPR-Cas9, what we find is that you get much faster growth of the catfish. And the muscle fibers are bigger. So this is muscle protein being formed. And this has been shown again and again in many species now that this gene, myostatin, if we gene edit it, we will end up with something like 20 to 30% increases in muscle growth uh, through a simple modification. In tilapia, if we just knock out one of the genes that produces melanin, we can end up with this beautiful gold tilapia. Why, you ask, do we want a gold tilapia? Well, often we get a real grey uh, tinge to the flesh of black tilapia. And this golden tilapia does not have that characteristic and therefore has higher market appeal. So very quickly, I've brushed through some of the areas in R&D around genetics. And um, I think we need to really invest more in catching up to many of the livestock and plant industry in the use of these modern gene um, technologies. The other big area, or another big area where we need R&D effort is around aquatic animal health. And you'd be probably shocked to know but about 40% of aquaculture production in some industries like shrimp is lost to disease. So if we could even just uh, increase our ability to improve disease outcomes by 20% or 40%, we would have a massive impact on the amount of food that we can produce. Disease is really bad. When it hits, it can have catastrophic effects on industry. So if we look here in shrimp, at the onset of a disease called acute hepatopancreas necrosis, necrosis disease, or AHPND. These circles and arrows indicate within various countries when this disease just suddenly appeared. And when it has appeared, it has dramatically knocked millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of value off the aquaculture produce. In Thailand, for instance, when it hit it, it caused over a 50% loss in productivity. 
which still the industry hasn't uh, really rebounded to. So disease and our ability to limit its impact is a major area of R&D that is required. And this slide just again shows you for shrimp, across the history of shrimp farming, where new diseases have arisen and hit, they've caused catastrophic losses in productivity. And the major one uh, has been white spot syndrome virus, which caused a real contraction of the industry um, globally. Now our ability to actually manage disease can be in many different ways. But one of the new R&D areas which is showing a lot of promise is our ability to actually sequence everything within the, the, the species of interest, the fish, the crustacean, the mollusk, using what we call next generation sequencing technology. And this allows us not only to see about diseases that we know about, but it also allows us to identify unknown pathogens and pathogens which might actually jump the species barrier eventually and become a new disease of importance. And I'm sure everybody's thinking of COVID here, and I promised myself I wouldn't mention COVID in this uh, presentation. But it's a similar thing. If we look in shrimp, for instance, a study done by some researchers in the Philippines using next generation sequencing, where they characterise all the pathobiome within the shrimp, what they found was they found a lot of their, yes, their known sh shrimp pathogens like white spot and IHHMV and MBV, but they also found a whole lot of other virus types which are known in insects to be pathogenic. And they're just sitting in the shrimp doing we don't know what and waiting maybe for the time that they mutate and therefore will cause some dramatic impact. But if we were watching these or knew that they existed, by the time we found out about them, probably it's going to be one or two, maybe three years after they've become a major disease and we've caused this massive loss in production. So the use of next generation sequencing technologies in aquatic animal health applications is definitely the future. And there's even this little um, sequencer that you can plug into your computer now which will sequence all the DNA in a sample and uh, allow you to produce an output similar like this where you can classify the viral um, pathobiome. We've even done this in black tiger prawns back here in Australia in a recent um, project that um, was led by Kelly Condon from JCU Aquapark. And we sequenced the pathobiome in the tiger prawn and we came up with a whole lot of possible viruses within the genome that we don't know anything about. We don't know whether they're subclinically affecting productivity or whether they're going to cause impact in the future. But now at least we can see what shrimp contain and track them if we want to in a targeted way into the future. So we can actually make sure that when if they do become a pathogenic agent, that at least we knew about them and can respond quickly. The other major R&D area of growth in aquaculture around aquatic animal health is that of this application of environmental DNA. And so all organisms leave DNA. When I leave this office this afternoon, I'm gonna have DNA all throughout the place. If we commit a crime, we're leaving cells, hair cells, whatever, that can be used to track us back using forensic techniques. Well, it's the same for aquatic organisms. They leave DNA as they move around in the water or if they live in the water. So if they're a unicellular organism like a, a bacteria or protozoans, uh, then we will be able to identify their presence in a water system simply by doing a DNA analysis. And this is called environmental DNA. I personally think this is really one of the most uh, exciting and significant developments that will occur in the future related to aquatic animal health. Our ability to be able to just take a water sample 
like this sample here, taken by my former uh, brilliant PhD student, Jana Gomez, where she was tracking the abundance of a pathogenic ciliate species called Chylogenella, this is it here, which occurs in freshwater barramundi. And what she showed was that if she measured the DNA levels in a water sample over time and assessed that against fish mortality over time, she found a very strong correlation with the abundance of the pathogen as indicated by eDNA and the mortality levels that were occurring in the barramundi. She then linked this to environmental parameters and started to find out in a pilot way at least of some water quality parameters that were changing that were maybe then stimulating the increase in abundance of the chylodinella, which then was becoming more of a problem for the barramundi. And this was all through just taking a simple water test and doing a DNA, running a DNA analysis. And so for Singapore, for instance, we could be using environmental DNA to monitor the presence of pathogens seasonally and understand how they cycle seasonally and putting management practices in place which limit their impact. It's got enormous potential. An extension of this environmental DNA approach is actually also trying to quantify the bacterial population that of the microbiome. Now the microbiome, you might have heard a lot about this lately because we're seeing that the microbiome in vertebrates, actually probably our gut and the bacteria in our gut are probably the most important organ we have besides our brain. And they even can influence how we feel. The microbiome is known to impact on all these various things in vertebrates and have a positive or negative effect depending on our microbiomes. But in our aquaculture species, we actually know very little about how their microbiomes influence things like nutrition, survival, growth and reproduction. However, there is some evidence that if we look more into the microbiome and understand how it is affected by the environment and how it affects production traits, we can lead to dramatic production increases and in general health of our, our species and the culture. This is a study done by another one of my brilliant PhD students, Sandra Infante Villamil, and she looked at the microbiome in black tiger shrimp in the gut of shrimp from a highly productive pond and that of from a low productive pond. And what she found is that when she classified the microbiome, so sequenced all the bacteria in the gut and classified them to the best of her ability, she was able to see that the microbiome clustered in a way by which the highly productive pond of shrimp had a microbiome which was quite distinct from that of a low productive pond. And in actual fact, there was dramatic differences in the species and the species abundance. So in its most simple form for the time, if we look at all the different bacterial groups um, that she was able to identify, we can see that these ones here in a highly productive pond were more in abundance or present even where they weren't present in the low productive pond. Whereas all these bacteria here were in increased abundance and probably have some negative effect on the growth of the, the, the shrimp. And we can even look at putting the bacteria against phenotypes like weight of our shrimp and doing what we call a heat map type analysis. And if you see here in the blue, means where there's a very negative impact on prawn growth. And so where we have an abundance of say vibrios, which is not surprising because vibrios are quite bad, we end up with a negative correlation with prawn weight. 
Whereas we had these species here in the red, we had a really positive impact. And so this allows us now to maybe go and identify these species more, understand what they do, maybe turn it into probiotics and add them to the pond in a way to stimulate a better outcome. So the microbiome is one of the big areas of interest and I'm really excited about uh, the potential of understanding the microbiome and us being able to use it to increase aquaculture productivity. But we need a lot more R&D. In fact, we have a lot of challenges with aquatic animal health. It's probably the biggest concern for us because it has such an impact. We don't know a lot about our pathogens. We don't know a lot about how our host actually respond to pathogens. We know how the human or the vertebrates immune system works. We have very limited knowledge of that of non-invertebrates, non-vertebrates. Non we don't know how the environment, the animal and the pathogen interact to cause the disease. The work of Gianni started to unpack that, where we could see track environment change to pathogen change to the host impact. But we need to do more of that. There's a lot of work here for the future that we need to uh, really invest in for us to realise aquaculture's growth potential. The next one of interest is nutrition. And I'm not a nutritionist, but I actually am becoming very interested in nutrition because nutrition will have a positive impact on growth, the health of our animals and the microbiome may be influenced by what we feed them. Now, most people probably have heard the fact that aquaculture is unsustainable industry or has been an unsustainable industry because of our use of marine derived fish resources to produce fish meal for protein and fish oil for those essential oils. If we look back in 19, about 1990 and look at the amount of marine protein and marine oil that was in our aquifers, yes, Aquaculture justifiably could have been criticised for its use of these marine derived um, sources, which are harvested from wild fishery effectively to feed aquaculture fish. But over the years, there's been dramatic R&D put into lessening our impact on these marine sources, where actually we decreased our reliance on this food source for our aquaculture species by about uh, 60%. An example of this, of where good R&D has led to this positive outcome can be seen in our old friend, the Atlantic Salmon. We're back in prior to 2000, I'm not sure what this date is, but probably when the industry was very early, 65% of the, the diet was composed of marine derived sources like trash fish. Now, and it's even better now actually, but by 2013, this fish resource that's harvested from the wild to feed our salmon has been reduced to only 18% of the diet. And um, Leo, if he's listening, or Kathleen, if they're listening, they will probably tell me it's a lot lower than that, where it's probably 16 or, or 15 or even lower. And this has happened for replacement of that marine protein oil sources with that of alternative ingredients. Uh, I'm just going to slip past that slide, sorry, for, for time. So we've been slowly replacing out the marine derived protein and oil sources with other sources of protein and oils. This might be from uh, land derived cereal crops like soy, for instance, or in the future, we're going to see more of our aquaculture diets being derived from this critter or these critters, that of insects. There is a lot of R&D and uh, scale up investment now going on into growing insects, particularly the black soldier fly and the yellow mealworm, for them to be then used as an alternative protein source for aquaculture foods. And it's very exciting. And there's a couple of companies in Singapore and Malaysia, for instance, which are uh, looking at taking food waste, 
waste that we produce by not eating ourselves and feeding this as a nutrient source to the black soldier flies and then turning that into a commodity that then can be put into our aquaculture feeds. It's very exciting. And some work done by another one of our brilliant JCU scientists, Kathleen Hua, in a recent review, has shown that um, basically by replacing the fish meal with insect meal, it has very little negative impacts actually on the growth performance or, or the metrics of performance of our aquaculture species up to certain levels of course. We still need a little bit, I guess, of that um, fish oil and that component maybe in the diet. So I'm not a nutritionist. But it's very exciting. But we do have some challenges here, everyone, for us to realise uh, more and more of an insect meal in our apple feeds. And that's basically, we need to overcome these challenges about the nutrient content of the insects themselves. Do they get fed different uh, food streams that often aren't standardised or different developmental stages have different nutritional profiles. Some insects might have any nutrition, nutritive and immunostimulative effects that we don't understand. So I think this area is where a lot of R&D is needed and will go in the future uh, for us to feed our fish in the tropics. Another really exciting, I love this actually, is um, getting away from multicellular organisms to produce protein and use our unicellular organisms like microalgae and yeast and bacteria to produce what we call single cell protein. So this is where we are actually trying to produce protein based on fermentation or, or industrialization of um, unicellular production like microalgae to produce a protein source that is entirely sustainable, often takes in our, some of our waste products and turns it into a protein source to be put into aquaculture feeds. A real nice one is that of a company called Callista, who use bacteria in a fermentation process where they add water and nutrients, oxygen, nitrogen, methane, pretty much that's all producing vats of bacteria which are very high in protein. They distill them down, package them, and these now can be put into animal feed diets as a protein source. And once I think we cut, we perfect this technology, we will really reduce our um, requirement for marine derived protein and oil sources for our aquaculture feeds. And the other thing I'm, I want to make a point about is actually we probably need to change the type of species that we are eating if we're concerned about the sustainability of our aquaculture feeds. Because not all species actually require a lot of fish meal in their diet. So some species like tilapia and carp and milkfish fish actually have very, very low requirements of fish meal in the diet. And so it can be produced on mass very sustainably without having to rely on us getting a um, marine derived protein and oil source to make the diets. So very exciting. Getting towards the end now guys, you're probably um, looking for the end. This is very exciting actually. This is where I think the merging of traditional aquaculture with technology will occur. And that is of digital aquaculture. Digital aquaculture is where we're really trying to unpack that box by using technology. And things like AI and machine learning, artificial intelligence and machine learning, where we can get information, certain data streams that are too complex for us to actually interpret ourselves and have that computer design an algorithm that best fits that data and tell us some information to help us make decisions. Or in this case, to measure the weight of a prawn from a photograph. So this is a project we've had within one of our uh, research groups, the ARC for um, advanced prawn breeding. We basically, from a photograph of a shrimp, we can predict its weight and we can predict 
its tail proportion weight with very high accuracy. And this will allow us now to rapidly be able to phenotype our animals. Or in the case of Barramundi, the same, from a simple photograph, be able to measure the weight, the length, the um, billet size, the tension of a barramundi simply from a photograph. And in some cases, this is where the technology gets really funky. I love this. I hope this plays. If I can play this, uh, wait a second, I need to get rid of the pointer. Uh, maybe. I don't know. Oh no, if I had a movie, how do I play that movie? Anyway, I can't play the movie. But a company uh, working with Microsoft, ABB, have invented an AI technology, which as the fish are swimming around in the tank, it will, using an algorithm, measure the fish and its weight in real time. And so just from the fish swimming around, the farmer can get very accurate information on the weight of their animals without even touching them. Because when you touch them, you cause a lot of stress. And I'm really disappointed if this one doesn't play, which I don't think it's going to. Because there's another technology developed based on AI by a company called Stingray, which actually uses a laser beam to shoot sea lice off Atlantic salmon. So they've trained an algorithm to detect from a video an Atlantic salmon which has a sea lice, and then Star Wars like sends out a laser beam, hits that sea lice, and kills it. All without the use of chemicals or stress to the animal through handling. It's just amazing how digital technology is going to transform our industry. Even things like biosensing, where this is a, an oyster which is put into an aquaculture scenario of this biosensor. And for the first time, we can get information on its heartbeat, on its temperature, on its physiology, and understand what is really happening. Or we can put these tags in fish, which can be tracked in real time where they're swimming in a cage or a pond and see whether the top of the cage, the bottom of the cage, whether they're feeding, whether they're not unrivaled information for us to be able to unpack our box through technology. And of course, this blending of AI and machine learning around disease, taking in all our parameters that cause disease potentially and training an algorithm to be able to predict with certainty where we are having a disease outbreak two weeks in the future because one parameter changed. And finally, R&D around environmental sustainability is very important. And there's some really cool stuff happening here. We have a lot of sustainability challenges for aquaculture. The industry has not had the best reputation early on because it grew so quickly. That is not the case now, it's a very sustainable industry, but we still have some sustainability challenges which are listed there. But we are tackling them through some pretty novel and cool technology. So one big problem for aquaculture is that of waste nutrients. And so we're looking now at integrating different species into, a, into an operation to be able to capture those nutrients and turn it into a product like seaweed. Rocky DeNice here at JCU has perfected this technique by um, developing technology that go on the back of shrimp farms and soak up all the nutrients and turn it into uh, a product, which then can be processed in many different ways, either human food or for bioactives or biochar for fertilizers or soil remediation. We're seeing a lot of R&D investment here and this is very exciting and we need more of it. Even using things like these bioreactors where we put a whole lot of wood chip into the ground and create a deoxygen uh, environment or oxygen, very devoid in oxygen. And when we pass water through here, what we find is that two things happen. It strips the nitrogen out of the water, which would be a nutrient, and turns it into a gas where it goes harmlessly into the air. 
also, and we're investigating this at the moment, it may actually help us treat disease because these bioreactors are so low in oxygen that as the water passes through, any organisms that require an oxygen will die. And so for harmful algae, we're finding that it strips harmful algae out very quickly and possibly made for protozoans. We're moving now to getting away from open systems that may have some sustainability issues and developing massive recirculation aquaculture systems like these seen, say, in mainstream in Melbourne, which grow barramundi or super intensive shrimp raceways where shrimp aren't farmed in ponds anymore. They can be farmed anywhere as long as there's seawater and they can produce up to 80 tonnes per hectare of product. Your average cow, by the way, when we farm is about one tonne per hectare of protein. We're seeing in Singapore, removing the environment from the ocean and having these barges like that of my friend, um, BT Liao, which has uh, ACE there in Singapore, where basically the water is pumped up, treated and circulated away from pathogens and can be remediated before it goes back into the ocean. Singapore aquaculture technology is another example of that. In salmon, entirely enclosing the sea cages in a, in a membrane so that sea life can't get in and nutrients can be controlled. Very exciting. So, I've had to rush through that, but I hope that I've been able to show tonight that the importance of aquaculture to the future of food security is sustained and will be sustained through R&D, and that the major areas of R&D will be based around us unpacking that box which is currently under the water for us and we don't understand how the fish or the shrimp actually grow and are impacted by disease because we can't actually access them unless we use technology. I want to make one last point here. We are seeing now a major shift globally in aquaculture from a low tech industry to a very intensive and high tech driven industry. And this is happening at amazing speed. Our human capital is not keeping up. There are major training gaps now that are going to arise as we intensify, where we need to train the next generation of aquaculturists up in new technologies, new methods for us to be able to fulfill that human capital uh, requirement. We need to adopt cross-cutting technologies, bring them across from other industries and apply them to aquaculture like we are currently trying to do. And only then, once we've done those, maybe begin to unpack their black box and really fulfill the destiny of aquaculture to feed the world. Thank you for listening. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed my talk. I've certainly enjoyed um, talking about aquaculture. And I'll hand you back to our chair now, Abhishek, if there are any questions. Thank you very much, Dean. In fact, this was one of the most informative um, webinars I've, I've, I've attended, especially for aquaculture and looking into food security and even the 2030 goal that Singapore has. Uh, and we should, we should, when we meet next time, rather than doing a, a cheers with beer mugs, we should look at probably seaweed shake and, and, and use that <laughs> as something to drink. There, there are plenty of um, questions um, and we'll go through some of those. Uh, but I must, I must acknowledge that uh, at one point of time, we had more than 120 participants live at the webinar, and, and which, was, which was just amazing, and more than 250 registrations. So uh, I know uh, there are people who have questions, and please, if you do, uh, I would uh, urge you to put your questions under Q&A uh, section that you can find at the, the bottom of your, your screen. So, um, let me go through some questions and, and there, are, there are a range of questions. So first let's look at a few related to genetics and, and then we can move on to others. Um, Satya Reza has talked about um, 
genetic modification. And his question is, would genetic modified uh, farm fish safe to consume? And, and, and what are the consumer perceptions of GMO? And, and of course, uh, the market of fish as such. Dean? Yeah, so um, most of us have probably been eating a lot of GMO plants derived foods. Uh, GMOs are used quite extensively for many of our, our plant-based industries now, like soy and corn, and um, they're out on the market. There's only one example of a GMO animal at the moment, which is being approved for food consumption, and that is the Atlantic salmon. Uh, but studies have shown conclusively, and it's been one of the most researched topics you know, in the last 30 years since gene technology really became an option, that there are really no negative human health consequences that come from GMOs. Where the concern might be is actually environmental because many of our species are farmed in areas where they also occur wild. And if there are escapees, then they may breed with the wild populations and introduce this new gene, which may be negative to the wild species. Um, but containment aquaculture will solve that problem into the future. But um, in terms of the health ben uh, problems with GMOs, I would have no issue eating a GMO barramundi or salmon or prawn or whatever in the future, um, as long as it tastes good. Thank you. In fact, the related question by Andreas, Andreas Lupata, uh, do GMO produced seafood have more allergens? And, and, and again, it's about uh, the impact on consumer. And similarly, along the same lines, Denise had a question on, uh, on, on GM, let me just scroll up, please, which was GM salmon and whether it stays the same, uh, especially in terms of gene expression affecting things other than size and growth rate. Yeah, so um, Andreas, you're the expert on allergens, so you should be telling me. Um, but as I said, uh, from any trials that have been done of a GMO, there have not been any real adverse effects on human health, where we're talking about plants or, or trials with animals. Um, so I'm not sure um, is my answer there. Uh, what was the second one? Uh, uh, one of the problems with GMOs may be that they grow too fast. And then there's welfare issues, actually, because the skeleton and that can't maybe keep up. This was a big problem, problem for chickens when people first started to selectively breed them. They were so good at them, made them grow so fast that the skeleton actually didn't have time to evolve to support the muscle mass. So you'd have chickens that would just sit there and do nothing, have bone deformities. So they slowed down the selection, they started looking at the bone structure and bringing it along at the same time and got around that welfare issue with chickens to some degree. But that may be, you know, an animal welfare issue may be one of the concerns around GMOs as well, unless we look at the organism as a whole and how changing that gene might affect other, other traits. But I think the GMO thing will go away because we're using a different technology than what we were initially concerned about with GMOs, where we are putting an extra gene, potentially from another species, into our organism. Now, what people are looking to do are to induce natural mutants that already occur within the species, but at very low frequency. And these are natural mutants because they have a single gene, single base pair chain sometimes in their gene. And that may confer an advantageous trait. That if we can just replicate that by gene technology, and produce broodstock, which produce that particular phenotype, then we will have a much more productive system. So that's where we're going now. And in actual fact, uh, many countries, Europe is behind, I'm not sure where Singapore is, but Australia, for instance, now are even not regulating under the gene technology um, regulator that of, of CRISPR-induced mutants. The, the next question, the related question was about uh, GM salmon, whether they have the same taste and, and whether gene, gene expression affects things other than size and, and growth rate. 
Yeah, not not sure, um, Denise. I think asked that question. Um, not sure. Probably not. Probably not. Like, there's no reason why it would affect taste. It's not like right. a tomato, which has yeah. been bred for lower sugar content because yeah. they store better. Like, it's still we're talking about just because of muscle mass. I think Chris Rudd has a related question. What are the top three aquaculture stock tips, Dean? The top three what? The top three aquaculture stock tips. Stock tips? Yeah. Um, I should not be mentioning the companies that I do work with. <laughs> um, no, there's, a, there's quite a few. Like, uh, I think any, any of them, Chris, which are major multinationals now, you're seeing a lot of like companies which were in pig and and poultry farming now are uh, also putting their interest in buying up investments around aquaculture, and and so you're seeing some of these major agri businesses now be involved in aquaculture. In Australia, there's one um, for Tassel and Sea Farms, for instance, which are going gangbusters in terms of their, their growth and their potential into the future. So maybe put a few dollars into there, but I don't want to get done for insider trading, so you can do that. So, so, so Dean, some of uh, some technical questions. Uh, there's one from Greg, Gregory Mays, uh, and probably this relates to one of your slides in the presentation. Why did omega-3 levels decrease between 2002 and 2010 in farm fish? Ah, that's a simple one. I can even answer that. I'm not a nutritionist. It's basically we're putting less of the fish oil in the diets. And, and, and so barramundi diets in particular have become increasingly more sustainable over time because we're developing diets where we still get the same sort of growth rate, but we're putting in less of that marine derived resource. And one of the consequences of that, of course, is that we're putting in less of the oils, which then are you know end up as omega-3 so uh, we we do see that quite a bit not only in barramundi but in salmon for instance where over time that good omega-3 level has been dropping and it's just due to our apple foods. but what's exciting is i didn't talk about it is that we can use like marine algae microalgae uh, and other um, sources which are high in omega-3 as feed to put into our apple feeds instead of uh, that fish oil and boost that omega-3 up in, in the future and make it, uh, you know, the levels that are where that's really nutrition, nutritional and of benefit to us to eat. There, there are a couple of questions, again, on nutrition, but to do with even the insect meal. So Polly Hilder has, has one and, and there's another one that, that Marie Tan asked. So it's, it's about, uh, so Polly's question is about microalgae production and, and subsequent protein and lipid production as fish meal slash oil replacement complete, uh, compete with the insect meal production um, in, in terms of cost and economy. And whereas uh, uh, Maria's, oh, sorry, Marie, Marie's asking, you know, whether insect meal is suitable for all types of fish. Mm, yeah, well, I think the work that Kathleen at JCU has done, a big meta-analysis has shown that um, insect meal is a good replacement for fish meal for most species where it's been looked at. And the, the nutritionists who bore me to tears when I talk to them, but I do actually take some of what they say in, they say that actually nutritionists don't care about the, the commodity itself it's just the nutrients that it has that is important in a diet. So basically, this is one of the advantages of aquaculture is that we can take all these alternative sources of protein and oil uh, and put them into our diets for fish and then uh, reduce the amount of fish, marine fish resources that are required. So insect meal is only one of a part of maybe 10 different types of protein sources that are available to us uh, as alternative sources to marine protein. Thank you. I think this, this also answers a similar question from ECT. Sorry, I'll just keep jumping. Uh, the moment a new question comes. Um, 
uh, Octavina had a similar question. Um, okay, let's move on. And um, Polly had a, a clarification from you. How expensive is the EDNA test sting? Only if, if you know about this. Yeah, it can be very inexpensive, actually. It can be okay. something like uh, 10 to $20 a test. Okay, that, that's, that's, I'm, I'm sure she would be delighted and there's few uh, thumbs up for that question. So a lot of people would be interested in that. Yeah, that's the that's advantage of it because the DNA technology has evolved so quickly and the price has dropped that um, pretty much it's a very affordable way to monitor your, your environment and how it affects your pathogens. But there's R&D that's needed to link up the pathogen with the environment with the host to know what you're actually looking for when something starts to change. Thank you. Jeffrey saying questions when selecting for fast growth of an animal that we select use phenotype that are aggressive. Do we know um, do we do we know how do we know ways to reduce this aggressive behavior? In, in mm -hmm. Actually the opposite occurs. Uh, as we domesticate species and select them the evidence tends to be that they become more classic uh, because they're not spending all their energy on trying to defend their domain or, or whatever. So the example of those crayfish I, I put up, when I first started that breeding program, I would put 10 crayfish in a tank and come in the next morning and there'd only be two left because they would kill each other overnight. But after two generations of selection, I could put that 10 crayfish in that tank and come back and nine of them would still be there. And it's because the aggression tends to be bred out of our animals over time. And uh, we see that in cows and you know, our pigs and all these domestic animals are no longer aggressive um, because they become more domesticated and tamed. Okay, I'll take a few more questions. Uh, there are a lot of... Um uh, thanking note for you for thanking you for the uh, for a lovely presentation and informative presentation but there are a couple of questions that deals with um, you know probably they're philosophical in nature so Nigel Mas Mamash talks about uh, uh, you know popular press and you know how fisheries have been affected negatively in terms of that growth and then there's anonymous attendee who has talked about you know whether animal farming is same as animal harming right so um, you'll find that there's been a dramatic shift in the position of many of our environmental agencies like World Wildlife Fund and Greenpeace to now, and even our friend Leo DiCaprio is a big advocate of aquaculture uh, because they see that it is a more sustainable option now that it's done correctly, well not correctly but more sustainably than us keeping to keeping on raping and pillaging the fisheries. We have to feed the world and aquaculture has become quite sustainable. Like look at that beautiful backdrop I have here, Pacific Reef, just down the road from Townsville. Very environmentally friendly farm. And uh, so we've seen these environmental agencies actually now supporting aquaculture because uh, they realise that it is saving fisheries in many places because it's reducing the pressure on the fishery. Yeah, I think Gerardine um, uh, supports that, saying that MBS, Marina Bay Sands, set a target of 50% of its total seafood by volume to be responsibly sourced by 2020 and is supporting several, uh, uh, several, um, several initiatives through WWF you know, along those lines. Well, thank you very much, Dean. Uh, we have, or well, you have answered more than 20 questions, but there are plenty of other questions in there. But unfortunately, we run out, run out of time here. You know, it's beyond six o'clock. Uh, but I hope you are comfortable if, if, if the participants would write to you directly, you know, seeking more clarification in those. So I would again like to, on behalf of the organizing team and the participants, thank you uh, for this presentation, Dean, and talking about something which is really important for us uh, as human um, footprint uh, continues to grow on, 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 on the globe and, and the planet. It's really important that uh, we look at more sustainable sources. So thank you very much, Dean, and thank you everyone you know, um, who, are, who are participating. And, and my apologies for some whose questions 
I couldn't take because you know we are really running uh, we're running late here at the moment. Five thirty was the time, and we're now beyond six o'clock. But I'm sure this is not the end of the uh, uh, end of conversation. This will continue. Uh, probably the satisfaction survey has just um, uh, popped on your screen. So please, um, I, I would like you to uh, uh, um, you know complete this survey. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a good evening. And you too, Dean. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, everyone, and eat more seafood, everyone, please. <laughs> good for you. Thank you.